Welcome. We're really pleased that you could join us today. Like you, we've been thinking a lot about COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter over, over the last few months. As the nation's largest history museum, we're tasked with collecting objects that reflect the American experience. And in thinking about the pandemic today, we've also been thinking about those objects that are already in our collection. In fact, when we looked at our existing collections, we discovered many objects that can provide us with insight into what we're experiencing today. So beginning in September, we started this series called Pandemic Perspectives, which looks at our collections in light of current events. And you can check out past talks, and you can also register for upcoming talks at our website. Today, however, we're going to do a panel that's a little different from the panels that we've done in the past. Um, and as we here at the National Museum of American History began collecting objects related to COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, we became curious about what our colleagues were doing at their museums. Both the pandemic and obviously the push for social justice are huge stories. No one museum can really collect these entire stories. So we really needed to reach out to our colleagues to better understand how to collect and to document these stories in collaboration with them. And the more that we hear as well from you all in the general public, the more that we can be sure that we're documenting this story from many different perspectives. So we hope today's panel will help us um, as well as museums across the country in this monumental task of documenting the extraordinary events of 2020. And we just wanna remind you, we hope to hear from you with your ideas about what to collect and what to document. So don't hesitate to contact us. We look forward to hearing from you. So with all that in mind, we invited three museums from across the country to share their stories about collecting. And we wanna thank our Smithsonian affiliates across the country for their help with this program. Um, Smithsonian affiliate museums have been wonderful partners with us here on many, many projects and this one in particular. So we're really pleased to welcome colleagues from three affiliate museums today, the New York Historical Society in New York City, the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh and the Colorado History Center in Denver. Um, before we begin, I just want to say that we very much want this to be a discussion. So we hope you'll join us throughout the entire hour asking questions of our speakers. And it's really easy to ask a question. Just go to the Q&A bar at the bottom of the screen and type in your question. And finally, before we start, I just want to quickly remind you that our next colloquium will be on Tuesday, December 15th. Um, if you could just flip to the next slide, Megan, that would be great. Uh, sorry, uh, if you could just go back one, <clears throat> that'd be great. So our next colloquium is going to be on Tuesday, December 15th, and that's going to be at 4 p.m. East Coast time, 3 p.m. Mountain uh, Central time, 2 p.m. Mountain, and 1 p.m. West Coast. And that's called Looking Good on that Zoom call. And it looks at our historic makeup and personal care collections. So if you want to wear flapper makeup on your next Zoom meeting, or if you just want to learn how to use shampoo again, uh, you'll want to join us at our next panel. And now I'm really pleased to introduce our panel of distinguished curators and museum staff. <clears throat> so Jason Hansen is the Chief Creative Officer and Director of Interpretation and Research at History Colorado. He's overseen the organization's History in the Making Contemporary Collecting Initiative, and he's led the development of numerous exhibitions, including Zoom In, the Centennial State in 100 Objects, Beer Here, Brewing the New West, Play Ball, a Celebration of America's Game, and Backstory, Western American Art in Context. He also works closely with the Colorado State Historians Council, and he's written on topics such as water use, mining, education, gender roles in utopian communities, and of course, your brewing history. Um, Rebecca Claussen is the Associate Curator of Mu Material Culture at the New York Historical Society. Um, through its History Responds initiative, she's collected materials from the 2017 Women's Marches, World Pride New York City 2019 celebrations, and climate strike, among many other events. She was the lead curator for the New York Historical Society's Stonewall 50 exhibition program, and she's co-curator of the upcoming exhibition, Art for Change, the Artist and Homeless Collaborative. Anne Mataros is director of the curatorial division, chief historian, and the director of the Western Pennsylvania Sports Museum at the Heinz History Center, 
where she's managed the curatorial and collection staff for more than 15 years. Anne has curated numerous exhibits on subjects as varied as pop art, the 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates, the history of the American flag, and the glass industry. She served as project director or curator for national and state award-winning exhibitions, including the Civil War in Pennsylvania traveling exhibit and From Slavery to Freedom. Currently, she's curating an exhibition on medical innovation in Western Pennsylvania. So welcome to our panelists. We're really pleased that you were able to join us. Um, and I thought it would make sense for us to start um, with you all just giving a little quick overview about what you're thinking about in terms of collecting at your museums. And um, I think it makes sense, even though it means we'll jump around geographically to go with alphabetical order. So I'll start with you, Jason, um, from the Colorado History Center. If you wanna just give us a little bit. Thank you so much, Lexi. And uh, I'm so uh, pleased to be here, proud to be here and honored to be here. Thank you so much. Um, as Lexi said, I am at uh, History Colorado Center at, uh, that is our flagship museum in downtown Denver, but the History Colorado System actually operates 10 museums and historic sites, including a lovely historic steam train uh, around the state. Um, we, uh, just to lay some groundwork here, we all got sent home on Friday the 13th. I think that was similar for a lot of people around the country, uh, March 13th. Um, we launched our uh, History in the Making COVID collecting program on March 25th. Uh, so for us, that was a really rapid response. Um, and the, the idea was to um, crowdsource our effort, uh, to ask people what we should be collecting, to uh, invite them to share their reflections, to share their photos, to share what this uh, experience uh, was to them, uh, what captured it. Uh, and we would be the repository for that. We also formed a partnership with a uh, local uh, reporting collaborative uh, to relay those things back out to make those available uh, as the media was covering the story. Um, and really worked on refining those tools until the end of May when uh, the protests erupted after the, the murder of George Floyd um, and others, including Elijah McLean uh, locally in the Denver area. And our museum was engulfed in those protests. We we're located just a block and a half from the Capitol. And uh, we, uh, you know, the, the crowds gathered around our museum for uh, many days uh, after that happened. And so we found ourselves uh, in a way, part of that story. So we uh, pivoted the tools we had developed for collecting COVID um, to try and, and start collecting uh, about the protests for racial justice. Um, and I think we'll, we'll see some of the examples of, of what we've been collecting, but I think that's enough of uh, groundwork and I'll uh, pass it along to next alphabetically. Rebecca um, from the New York Historical Society. Hi, thanks so much for, for having me on here. Um, so the New York Historical Society is, is located in the Upper West Side of Manhattan and um, was founded in 1804 by a group of men who, who in that post-revolutionary war moment um, were really anxious to preserve the history of the new nation. And so across our long history, we have been in many ways collecting uh, related to current and recent events. Um, and, but the History Response Initiative, um, which really kind of codifies our responsive collecting efforts, um, was founded in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, um, September 14th actually um, is, is when it began. And um, we formed a very large collection of, of materials documenting that event and the city's response. Um, and then so the degree to which we uh, kind of reactivate that initiative as it were, um, somewhat corresponds to the scale of the event. And so um, when the pandemic, uh, when we were you know, sent home from work, um, you know, like the folks at Colorado, um, as Jason mentioned on, on March 13th, um, we you know, were already sort of um, triggered, I guess, to, to think about collecting. Um, and the first item that I thought about collecting was um, a, a, a bottle, a very large bottle of hand sanitizer, of Purell, um, that somebody I knew posted as an Instagram story. Um, and you know, it, it was a moment of scarcity, and that's when I knew that our values 
uh, the way that we value objects it had really turned on its head. Um, and so I reached out to that person um, that day and that was the first object we collected. Um, and then our library division also collects um, paper-based materials and digital materials and um, they also started collecting. Um, and then we've been coordinating since then. Um, we, you know, quickly created a web page um, with, with our new project um, and set up a, a new dedicated um, email address. Um, and then have done a lot of outreach as well um, to, to different folks, um, especially in healthcare um, and different aid organizations um, and businesses. So, um, and then once the, the protests um, uh, broke out in New York City in, in the late May, um, we started collecting in the field. So it's been a real combination of, of projects and, and um, efforts. Great, thanks. And Anne? Um, we've been around, the, the Heinz History Center is only um, about 20 years old. It opened in 1996, but the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania that manages the institution has actually been around since 1879, where Pittsburgh's oldest cultural institution. Uh, but for most of our history, we really existed as a library and archives and as a programming institution. So it wasn't until the 80s when the steel industry began to decline that our community really said, wait a minute, who's going to save the story of what Pittsburgh has represented to the country and the world? Um, where are people going to find that history? And the community really came together and formed what has become the History Center. Um, so we only really began collecting broadly on the museum side in the 1980s um, and uh, unfortunately have been tasked in the past um, 10 or so years with really focusing how do we collect what's going on currently. Um, oh, certainly around 9-11 when Flight 93 went down in Somerset County, which falls within our collecting region, um, not, not in any way to the extent that places like New York Historical um, did we have to collect and the Park Service has a site there, um, but we were faced with how we tell that story and how we preserve that story. And then more recently with the Tree of Life tragedy, the shooting at the synagogue in um, the Squirrel Hill neighborhood where I live uh, here in Pittsburgh, um, we really had to face head on, how do we document this story, how do we preserve it, um, and how do we uh, capture the community's reaction to it um, and the community's experience of it. Um, and we developed a web portal where we could invite the public to share their and submit their digital content, whether it was, you know, I found out that day that the way we found out about friends and neighbors who belonged to that synagogue was through, you know, my kids looking on Facebook and um, Instagram and, you know, through social media. And it, the question of how do you preserve that? How do you um, capture the thing, at these events as they happen um, in the moment really tasked us as an institution for um, how do we work as a partner with a community institution? How do we reach out and document this story from every angle? So that became very helpful when we all went home um, in March and closed our doors and were closed till July. Um, our staff had some experience with how to um, quickly um, involve the community in this effort of collecting and how to um, develop some of the apparatus to do that, even though we faced um, problems that we'll all, I think, talk about today of, you know, how do you collect the objects when you can't interact with people and you're worried about, is it safe to touch them? And all those questions that we've had to kind of wrestle with over the past seven or eight months. Uh, but at least we're informed by some recent experience in how to involve a community and partner um, to preserve a story and how to assess a current event and make decisions about um, what we should be saving for the future. Thank you. Um, and Rebecca, I was really struck by your comment that you all, uh, your first object that you collected was hand sanitizer because it felt like, and it feels like often, at least for us here at the museum, that masks are the big uh, thing that everyone is collecting. Um, and so I'm, curious how you all have been thinking about masks um, and you know I know that you all are collecting some masks and actually we can show you all some images of the masks that uh, Jason and Anne and Rebecca are collecting and I'm 
curious if you guys could talk a little bit about, you know, why, why these objects, um, why did they become so iconic? Are they so iconic? Um, and and how, how do we think about them differently? Because they're, it, at the end of the day, they're all kind of the same and yet different. Well, uh, since this is something that uh, the slide, you know, what's on the slide is something that we collected. Um, I'll start out. Well, I, I mean, masks are just, uh, you know, the most obvious visual signifiers of, of adjustments to personal behavior um, in response to disease. And, um, you know, back in uh, January, February, early March, um, you know, one thing that struck me in what photojournalists were capturing is, um, is that they included a lot of images of people wearing masks way before the bulk of New Yorkers were actually wearing them. Um, and so it was a, a visual cue to um, people that you know, there's concern about, about disease. Um, but uh, I think also collectively and individually, we had to really figure out how this whole mask thing was going to work. We had to decide to wear them. We had to figure out how to, to make them and refine you know, their design for different purposes, um, you know, working out um, different faces. Um, and we had to determine what materials were appropriate. And so what I like about this particular selection here, uh, which is two of say, I think 12, uh, that we collected from a grassroots group called Masks for Medicine, um, which basically started um, after the CDC changed its guidelines on March 17th um, to say that fabric masks could be used um, as a last resort. Um, you know, there was this sense of a, a, a like a war effort um, where home sewers and apparel manufacturers were pivoting and home sewers were learning how to sew um, and there was a shortage of materials. And so the one on top, um, you know, shows uh, what is probably a very good design for us, even at, in this present moment. Um, and it's got a, uh, a nose wire, um, which the uh, volunteers at Mask for Medicine really noted was like, wow, that's a really good mask, <laughs> um, especially for uh, late, you know, in April, whenever that was, that they received it. And then the one on the bottom really shows, um, I think this kind of homegrown, uh, make, it, make it work kind of moment where there's um, uh, rick rack or, or whatever it is um, used to create the straps. Um, and it's a very, um, very tiny actually. They were like, well, maybe it's used for usable for a kid. Um, and, you know, so it's very much somebody who's like learning how to sew and is dealing with um, whatever materials they have at their home. So I think that um, that's, if that at all addresses uh, what your original question was, um, I think that's really interesting with this. So yeah, that's spot on, Rebecca. And if I had to, you know, guess at you know one object to become the visual identity of the, the COVID nineteen pandemic, I think it's going to be the face mask. Um, you know, you see here, uh, this is a mask that our governor Jared Polis wore uh, in announcing. Uh, that he was asking all Coloradans to, to wear masks whenever they were in public. Um, he was on the early side of that uh, nationally, but the fact that masks have become, um, you know, polarizing is another big piece of this story that, uh, you know, we have a term like maskivist in our lexicon now, um, I think is really telling and, and sort of speaks to the depths that uh, a mask, we also have masks that are, you know, uh, home sewers here responded by organizing clubs and, and sewing masks for, for people who needed them. Uh, we collected uh, some of those when they became available. Um, and lots of images when we put out the call to, you know, what, uh, what represents this pandemic moment to people. We got lots of images of masks that they were sewing or, or modeling, um, sometimes modeling not as masks were meant to be worn. Um, and uh, I, I do think the mask above every other object that we're uh, collecting is really going to be that iconic piece that, that instantly transports people to this story and, and helps them understand some of the depths. I mean, I don't know that people of the future will look at these pictures of masks and, and be like, yeah, that looks controversial. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the kind of story that we're going to be able to tell with these masks. And I know you guys collected some masks too. Um, I think 
the interesting thing was in the beginning, we had this whole argument about how many of these things are we going to collect because they're basically all the same. And yet um, our feelings about them have changed over time. Jason's slide inspired me when I saw that slide, the governor's mask, what a great object. And I'm so disappointed that our county commissioner who would be the closest thing here in Pittsburgh wears a disposable mask all the time when he's on television. He's, so this sense of um, how do people get these things in the beginning, you know, you had to make it yourself. You couldn't, they were in short supply, they weren't available um, to uh, how they begin to personalize them to how they've become now kind of a fashion piece. Um, you can buy them at Old Navy and at the Gap and at American Eagle and all these people make their own masks. Um, if you're a college student, you can buy them with your you know, school logo on them. And what I'm interested in now lately is the um, sideline masks being worn by the Steelers and pit football players and the coaches and this whole use of the kind of gator by people in athletics. So that's my new thing in terms of collecting this. So I'm just looking for, for us, it was a story because in the beginning, you know, we had such a battle over, you know, how many of these are we really gonna have? Are we gonna have a hundred of these and what story are they gonna tell and why are we gonna put that time and effort into it? And now I'm starting to see there really are so many different kind of nuances to these as personal identifiers and that kind of capture the change over time and the trajectory of this virus that we really need to be more thoughtful in the way we approach these um, and the, you know, kind of uh, the message that they'll give to uh, people in the future about what this was all about. We actually have a question from our audience, um, and I know you all slightly touched on this, but I'm wondering if you could expand on this. And that's um, thinking about hand sanitizers and masks, especially early in the pandemic. Um, was there a concern that you all had about taking objects for collections that people needed for healthcare that were in short supply. I can start off by saying yes, uh, absolutely. And we tried to be really mindful of that. In fact, I think like many museums, we donated our supplies of PPE at the beginning to local hospitals that needed them. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, it may look like we just went right out and collected all these things, but it really wasn't until it felt like Either you know someone was done with that mask, for instance, the the governor, or uh, there wasn't that shortage. Um, we've got a uh, one of my favorite objects that we've collected is um, in Colorado, and I, I think elsewhere, um, a lot of the uh, distilleries switched over to making hand sanitizer, and so we have a, a distillery here called Tenth Mountain Division Whiskey, and. Uh, they switched over to hand sanitizer, and when they felt like they were meeting demand, they gave us a, a bottle of it so that we could add it to the collection. I'd just say, too, we just got um, a board member who manages Mind Safety Appliance Company here in Pittsburgh, just after the board meeting, reached out to talk about this uh, partnership they developed with Allegheny General Hospital. So they're a uh, supplier to industry. They started out in the mining industry and now the bulk of their business is with um, Homeland Security and first responders, um, but they did industrial masks and N95s. So certainly we wanted N95s for them, but then they developed this whole um, uh, industrial mask into a mask with uh, four healthcare workers on the front lines. And so there's this whole story of this partnership with medicine um, so for us, it's just a story that continues to evolve. Um, and, you know, there I could say now with the, a little bit of time, um, you know, when you have the availability, we can have this. Do you have prototypes? Do you have patent drawings? Do you have sketches? What other kinds of things do you have that document this partnership and this kind of evolution uh, from industry to uh, healthcare uh, of this kind of piece of material culture? Um, well, I was wanted to just move to talking, I mean, we've raised this issue about shortages um, and documenting shortages. Um, and I think that's really hard for us to do. How do you document, uh, how do you collect around something that isn't there? Um, and so I'm wondering if you all could talk about that. And also the flip side, we just had a question from our audience 
um, which is about food banks. Um, so shortages of food as well. You know, how do we document not just the shortages that we have in stores, but also how do we document um, the shortages that people have in their own homes uh, in terms of food uh, and uh, other similar issues? So since this is our picture, I'll just mention, um, in the very beginning when we were talking about this, um, one of the hard lessons I've learned from collecting related to sports is sometimes there's nothing more valuable than owning your own photographs of things. So in the beginning, I said to people, um, we have a couple people on our uh, curatorial staff who are really accomplished photographers. And I said, when you go to the grocery store, will you take photographs of the empty shelves? Um, will you take photographs of people's carts and what they're buying? Because otherwise, We've got to try and find that in the future. Um, and we it better that we own this stuff. So we started talking about what are the things we should be going into the community and documenting. Um, so we'd be sure to have them in the collection, you know, 20 years, 100 years from now. Uh, so shortages, you know, nothing spoke more than the empty shelves where the toilet paper used to be in the first couple months of this um, pandemic. Yeah. I know you also had some images, um, Jason, of shortages too. So I was wondering if you. Yeah, absolutely. This really uh, came from when we asked people what their experience of the pandemic was in the early days. Uh, to Anne's point, um, it's wonderful to have, have the photograph yourself, to own the photograph. And uh, that was people's experience was, was these sorts of shortages and they found all kinds of ways to document it for us and share that with us. Um, it's a, a very similar shot from our local grocery store to the one in Pittsburgh. Um, and it, uh, I think is another one of those things that, you know, will stand the test of time and instantly sort of jog people's memory about this for as long as it's in living memory. Oh yeah. Remember the the toilet paper shortage. That was a weird thing about that uh, pandemic experience at the beginning. Um, so it, it really, in terms of documenting uh, shortages, I think it we have to thank uh, our community for stepping up and, and showing us where those shortages were. And it was, um, you know, we can kind of joke about toilet paper now, but there were certainly more uh, uh, emotional um, photographs that uh, people missing from where they should be in families. Uh, you know, people found ways to document that with sending us photographs of, of you know, uh, there was one that really sticks with me, um, uh, a funeral service that had to be postponed. And so they, they set up a, a little memorial in their home and then sent us photographs of that. We also set up a, a, um, a voicemail, uh, I like to call our oral history hotline, although our oral historian tells me I shouldn't. Um, and we invited people to just leave a message about their experience because we wanted it in their own words. And that was another case where um, things like how much a high school teacher was missing his students. Uh, or the uncertainty around somebody's work, they'd been sent home from a restaurant and weren't sure what was gonna happen. Uh, that was another way that we were able to, to document the absence of something. Rebecca, were you all documenting that sort of absence as well? Um, so we did receive um, images sent by, by people of empty shelves and, and all of that. Um, but you mentioned a question about food insecurity. And if we wouldn't mind jumping to it, another slide, um, it's I believe slide 19 or 20. Um, um, anyway, so they are, um, they are objects from their paper bags from an organization called Heart of Dinner, um, founded by uh, Moonlin Tsai and Yin Chang, um, a couple. And Moonlin is um, owner, co-owner of a restaurant in Chinatown um, in New York City called Kapitiam. And um, her parents had also been um, Chinese American restaurant owners in San Diego during the SARS pandemic in 2003. 
And so, um, you know, they, everyone was witnessing uh, the uh, xenophobic response um, around the coronavirus um, and seeing diminished um, uh, foot traffic to restaurants in Chinatown. Um, and then when the pandemic hit and the, and the shutdown really hit, um, you know, there was a total absence of business, of course. So uh, this was a way for them to give business to, uh, to these restaurants and also to provide meals to um, homebound Asian American uh, elders and food that was also culturally specific. So they would provide hot meals, um, things like congee, um, and they would provide um, uh, produce um, like bok choy and that sort of thing. And then the additional component to this is these decorated paper bags. Um, and they're really charming. So they have notes uh, that say in Korean um, or Chinese, um, you know, messages like we are thinking of you, we care about you. Um, and then those are sent, those notes are sent from around the world. And then they have um, volunteers who decorate the bags with um, these very personalized, you know, one of them on the left has um, a Sudoku, you know, in case you're bored and you're at home alone, here's something you can do, Sudoku. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, I, I've been talking about these as um, an onion of care, of culturally specific care. Um, everything about them is totally tailored to the recipient um, and with the utmost of, you know, warmth um, and compassion and, um, and care. And they are very um, fastidious about making things um, in the language of, of these um, recipients and um, making the food very specific. And so um, this is just one of the many uh, grassroots efforts that's emerged in New York City um, around food insecurity. So, so and I, I think as hard as documenting these physical things that aren't there, and um, both of you are touching on this, is kind of documenting this experience of loss and what people are missing in their lives. You know, it struck me when I had to take my son back to his college dorm in Ohio to help him move out. And we had a two hour window and only two people could be in the hallway and the entire campus was empty. And this sense of these places that should be full of people um, and they're empty or this sense of, you know, students who aren't having the experience of graduating um, or are losing out on their senior year, um, special events, prom. Um, you know, these personal moments, milestone moments in people's lives, the funerals, um, the memorials that people don't get to have. You know, it's a whole different uh, challenge for us to record uh, those emotional and personal losses um, at this time. And I do think Jason's right. It's kind of personal voice that allows um, people. And we've invited people. There is a portal where just like at Colorado and New York where people can leave their own stories they can leave them as an audio, they can leave them as a video and upload them. Um, they can write them. And we are getting some really moving kind of people who have journaled their whole experience um, over the past few months, uh, those kind of records um, that are just invaluable. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, Megan, if we could go to slide 20, um, just because we had some questions. Um, uh, we've been talking about um, sort of patient perspective people impacted by the pandemic, but we've had some questions about uh, healthcare providers um, and medical equipment as well. So sort of that patients, practitioners, tools in the pandemic kind of story. And I'm curious if you all could expand a little on that. Um, Well, this object is actually um, a drawing uh, promoting the 7 p.m. clap um, that was created by uh, a, a Brooklyn family. These are 10 year olds. Um, and so that when people went on their socially distanced walks, um, you know, they would see this, these drawings promoting the 7 p.m. clap. And what I think about um, is interesting about this particular drawing is the ways in which children um, are really savvy um, and, and really catch on quite quickly. Um, about uh, you know changes in cultural norms and, and um, social rituals, um, but um, as far as uh, tools and and um, other medical equipment and um, 
things related to healthcare workers, um, more specifically in the work that they do, um, we have been collecting various, say, 3D printed um, items uh, that uh, anticipated shortages um, or were to um, help out with by extending N95 masks, for instance. Um, we've collected uh, items from hospitals that were you know, say thank you cards and drawings and other artwork that were posted in inside um, rest areas for healthcare workers during um, March and April. Uh, so those types of things. I'm wondering, Anne, if you could flip the next to the next slide, um, Megan, that would be great. Um, Anne, I saw you actually, you guys are also collecting sort of the tools then that test kit. Um, how did you guys decide on which test kit to collect? Because there's many out there. Um, these are because, um, I mean, sometimes it's just happenstance. We have a relationship with the um, Human Engineering Research Laboratory um, here in Pittsburgh, which is part of the Veterans Affairs in the University of Pittsburgh. And they're primarily involved with designing mobility devices for people with disabilities. Um, but they switched when there was a demand in the um, community to doing 3D printing of nasal swabs for testing. Um, so because we had that relationship and we knew about them, um, it was easy to kind of reach out and bring in these materials. Um, also with the partners that we're working with um, on this medical innovation exhibition, you know, the University of Pittsburgh has been involved with developing their own uh, vaccine. So we've had discussions with them. Obviously there's nothing now um, that they can give to us. Um, but we've indicated our interest and talked about what we'd like to uh, have. But you know, hopefully by the time we're done, we'll be able to represent kind of all the testing kits. Um, these were just the kind of first to come to the table. So um, we have a question which I find really interesting. I, I don't think um, I saw anything in your slides that really represented this, um, but it's certainly something that we've been struggling with and thinking about it. So someone asked if um, you could talk about um, <clears throat> whether you're collecting around um, sort of this tension, especially over mask wearing uh, or scarce supplies um, and the sort of um, sometimes uh, belligerent violence, I guess is the way to say it, um, that people have engaged in, um, in pushing back when they're asked to wear a mask in a restaurant or uh, in a, um, uh, store and we were wondering if you'd collected any videos, any images from those events. The, the thing that comes to mind for me, uh, our uh, curatorial staff um, collected a uh, number of rally signs for uh, at President Trump rallies in the state, uh, keep America working again, or keep America working, those sorts of things. Uh, I think I, I think there may be a slide of, of that particular sign, um, but no, it's um, in a way uh, we we have uh, gathered some signs that ask people to wear a mask in order to to come in and to keep their distance, and I think um, you know that's probably as close as we get to then telling the story of why we had to have signs uh, that said no buttons without your mask. So we oh, go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, um, only to say that it, it's definitely been on our radar. Um, I, I keep looking out for anti-mask um, protests and rallies, mm -hmm. but I have yet to go, but um, they're on my bookmarks. Um, <laughs> and um, there was recently news about um, a bar in Staten Island that um, has declared itself an autonomous zone, um, an, a mask-free and uh, autonomous zone. So um, I hope to reach out to them. And I'll just say we have a couple in process. Of course, Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania in general um, was really in play as a major um, decider of the presidential election. So both candidates came here a number of times in the closing weeks. And there were some huge rallies in Erie, Butler County, um, airports outside the city of Pittsburgh uh, for Donald Trump. And this was a um, issue that was uh, you know, part of the um, signage, the discussion, the um, 
uh, policy uh, that was important to the people who attended those rallies. So we're just starting to work into that. Also some of the political signage, the yard signs, there have been some really um, uh, pointed ones about these issues and about people's personal freedoms that we're working on collecting. The other thing we're working on collecting is the whole um, discussion over whether schools, especially K through 12, should be open or closed. So we've just started to work with a really active group of mothers in one of the suburban school districts around here um, who have been protesting the closure of their uh, elementary schools and in their districts. Um, and so it's t-shirts, it's literature, it's um, organizational materials, it's signage, uh, all related to this, you know, open up our schools, um, you know, get our kids back into school issue that's become um, a real battleground. So um, we I wanted to huge stories that we're trying to tell. One is obviously um, the pandemic, but the other obviously is the Black Lives Matter. And I'm wondering if we could move and talk a little bit about what you all are doing in that area. Um, and I'm especially curious, we have someone talking about panelists balancing that desire to collect around those twin pandemics um, with caring for your communities and what does reciprocity look like uh, and how do you communicate with different communities um, in this regard and what are you collecting um, in regard to Black Lives Matter as well? Um, sometimes it's hard to pull these two stories apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I wanted to mention, so I think, uh, segue, um, you know, we're, we're all focused here in this conversation on what we've gone out and, and really intentionally collected. Uh, but a lot of this, um, you know, I'm sort of pleased to say the systems that I'm sure we all have set up to collect newspapers, for instance, uh, from uh, our areas are also great sources of, of documentation that uh, are where, you know, a lot of the argument over masks and schools uh, and whether it's safe to go out to a protest and how people feel about uh, the protests, at least uh, the ones that erupted in, in Denver, um, you know, it, it's captured there. And uh, I think that's a, a really important source that maybe we just don't think about enough, but one of the largest contemporary collecting initiatives that any museum has uh, would be collecting current media. Um, so that's uh, a really important piece of this. Um, in terms of reciprocity and care for our community, I think uh, we were in a really unique spot here at History Colorado because, as I said, the, the protests engulfed our building. Uh, uh, we actually had a break-in at one point. We had n a lot of broken glass, um, windows broken out, that sort of thing. A uh, lot of graffiti. Um, and we decided sort of on that first morning that the, the story wasn't about us. We weren't gonna make the story about our museum and, and the damage to our museum. Um, you can see some of it, some of it there. Um, what we did was uh, we, we took these tools that we'd already established with our COVID collecting, um, which had a system for getting these sort of expediting things into our online databases so that they could be shared back out, used by uh, that media collaborative that I mentioned at the beginning um, to uh, uh, just make it available. You can see there um, that that some of the, uh, we didn't have enough plywood to cover the whole building. There's just, the, our building was not designed with a riot in mind. And so there's just acres of glass. Um, and we didn't even have a good way to attach plywood if we could in a lot of places. So we have these vinyl panels and uh, some of our local artists used them as canvases um, throughout the protests. And then we collected that one in particular, um, we added to our collection uh, because it, it seemed uh, emblematic. Um, we also, well, I don't know, I'll stop there for a moment because I'd love to hear what's going on in, in Pittsburgh and in New York, but certainly have lots more to say about it. I'll jump in then. Um, we have a person on staff, Sam Black, who's our 
director of our African American program. So, and we have a, a long-standing advisory committee, uh, community partners. Um, so, when uh, this uh, the social justice movement started, um, we had uh, great connections to um, reach into the community and begin to kind of document and collect and ask for their input and their ideas. Um, also, you know, just things like our connection to the medical industry, this whole White Coats for Black Lives, which is a national movement. Uh, in June, they had held a um, major day of protest where out on the lawns of UPMC where there were thousands of doctors out there wearing these t-shirts. Um, so we were able to, you know, bring that in and kind of tell a different kind of story, um, part of the national movement that had a Pittsburgh connection. Uh, so, um, you know, we really look to the photographers and the people in the community to kind of lead us to uh, who we should be working with. So as well as, you know, as well as doing kind of the grassroots, being on the ground, going out, finding these materials, we we're also just reaching into our network and asking them to kind of guide us and lead us and help us and advise us um, as we uh, worked on this issue. Um, for us, in terms of Black Lives Matter collecting, um, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in, in the field on the streets, and um, it was by speaking to people that um, I've, you know, come to understand what what you know the what the good what the important stories are to represent and um, who you know key figures would be, um, and so it's it's through those um, ongoing conversations. Um, this is a, what we see on the screen. Um, so, you know, shortly after the protests in New York City um, uh, broke out, um, there was a, you know, widely publicized um, uh, looting and um, d property destru destruction. Um, and so these murals are in Soho, um, various, all the businesses in Soho, um, or those who could at least, um, boarded up quickly, either because they had been looted or um, in order to prevent uh, looting. Uh, but then artists, um, you know, Soho uh, is a um, historically been a, a major center for artists um, living there. Um, and so artists, not necessarily living in Soho, but uh, a large number descended into the streets and began painting on the plywood. And it really had this amazing feeling, you know, even though there was all of this kind of sadness and destruction, um, that there was this tremendous flowering of creativity as well. And it was all of these personal voices um, and their contributions to, um, you know, the political moment and urgency um, of the moment. And so, um, we collected these two that we see here. Um, what's also really great about these images is that you know, they were donated to us um, by a photographer who went out of his way to document all of the murals that he found in Soho. Um, and so it's a, you know, there's a, a, a two-pronged um, donation, both the murals themselves and the photographs documenting them. Um, and we've also, um, you know, in trying to locate these murals because some of them, it was really a touch and go situation. Some of them would disappear um, within a day, either they'd be stolen by people who um, were street art um, aficionados and wanted to sell them on the market, or they'd be painted over because they, you know, some high-end retailer, luxury retailer doesn't necessarily want a BLM mural on their storefront um, uh, uh, and various other reasons. But, um, you know, it was really um, kind of an, I don't know, an old fashioned way of, of going about collecting because I could find everyone I needed to speak to on the street. And so I would go from you know, one spot to another and just speak to people um, and learn the story and really understand the greater context by having many, many conversations on the street, so. I'm gonna sort of combine a, uh, several questions that we received. I mean, one of the things that's odd about tragedies is it's very human for us to also look for humor. Um, in these tragic moments. And um, that's really what makes us human in many ways. Um, and so we had someone asking about collecting memes. I know you all have touched on the idea of oral histories, which can enable us sometimes to see that complexity of those funny stories that people tell. I'm curious if you all could touch on that, the, the moments of humor or memes even, which have become so common and are such a 2020 
Um, Lori, are you collecting that? So one of the things we can do with our digital portal is grab things, whether it's somebody else's website, whether it's, you know, when um, the BLM movement started with the kind of statements made by institutions throughout the community in support of the um, social justice movement, um, we can gather those and kind of download them into our portal. So they sort of live that digital content that normally um, might disappear or has a kind of time element to it could uh, be saved. And it's the same thing with these elements of humor, whether it's going out and photographing some of these um, signs or uh, things that are posted that are a humorous response to uh, uh, what's going on or people's experiences, um, being able to capture the social and the digital content and preserve it um, in our own uh, uh, portal has been very helpful. We haven't been collecting digital memes per se, but I did collect something that uh, was because it was a meme and that was a uh, bottle of Corona beer. Um, and, <laughs> you know, there was some, um, you know, whether or not, you know, the, the sort of like, myths around Corona, that beer being, um, you know, a cause of, of the virus or um, a way of to spread it, um, you know, whether or not that's, um, I guess, considered serious. It was also that Corona was a celebratory drink um, as sort of like gallows humor, I guess. Um, and so I, I actually happened to drink this one to uh, gamely <laughs> acquire the bottle. Um, <laughs> but um, so that was a moment of, of humor that I had myself. <laughs> Jason was Colorado, were you all? Uh... I think the, um, the creativity uh, and humor came out uh, with our business owners who, at least in the first round of shutdowns, uh, had some really charming messages, uh, sometimes laugh out loud funny. And we did, we, uh, we sent curators around town to document those uh, both in Denver and in Pueblo. And so uh, I don't think I included any of the slides here, but um, uh, uh, Gala's humor, uh, definitely was one of the common themes through there, um, but we saw just a, a lot of creativity and lightheartedness about uh, the messaging, you know, encouraging messaging. Uh, it's a, a, I myself, I live in downtown Denver and, and walked around, you know, our theaters were all closed. Oh yeah, I really enjoyed that one that you shared, Anne. Um, <laughs> theaters were all closed and they all had uh, sort of jokes on the marquees for a while that uh, we, we got photographs of. So insofar as, as that, but memes, I think our staff has traded a lot of them, but uh, I am thinking that we probably should be collecting some of them. Uh, one question that we ask ourselves is um, trying to find that balance between the national story and the local story. You know, why is this uh, the Colorado uh, aspect of the story? Why would we add this to the, the state of Colorado's collection. Um, and so we're, um, I don't know, I think we probably haven't looked at memes through that lens because they just seem ubiquitous and uh, sort of in the zeitgeist. Yeah. Well, I'm curious um, about uh, sort of um, also in a much more serious level, um, what about undertakers um, individuals who are dealing with the darkest side and the most difficult aspects of the pandemic. So very much the flip side of um, the idea of humor. I'm wondering if you all are collecting. I know you mentioned, a few of you mentioned um, collecting around funerals. And how difficult is that given that you're intruding on an extraordinarily personal moment? Have you made a decision to, to consider that kind of uh, collecting, or have you resisted it for, um, because it is so personal? For us at, at this moment, um, the collecting we've done in that respect has been what people have volunteered to us. <clears throat> uh, we have um, sort of made the decision to uh, not intrude in that way in, in 
uh, people's sort of most difficult moments. Um, but we also find that there are people who are sharing those with us um, anyway. And so I think uh, as things sort of wear on, um, that might be something that we look to document uh, a little bit uh, slightly after the fact instead of right in the moment. Um, I think there's gonna be that opportunity to, to work with people, uh, to talk about their mementos, um, to get their memories and, and recollections without having to be present right in that moment. I would largely agree with uh, Jason. We've, um, for the most part, held off uh, because, you know, the feelings are still so raw um, and we're only just starting to see uh, people, you know, approach us with possible donations. But um, when another aspect of that is that, um, well, there are two aspects. First is that uh, a large number of the country resists the idea that there is even um, something called the coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic um, and is in complete denial. Um, and so that complicates our ability to recognize um, and fully mourn and help people fully mourn uh, by memorializing their legacy um, through objects. And then um, the second thing is that um, for some uh, relatives who have lost loved ones, they don't always want their loved ones to be simply remembered by um, this terrible experience that we've all been collectively, um, you know, witnessing, feeling, all of that. So um, it's also going to be, I think, for us, remembering the fullness of their lives and the fullness of their legacies, who they were as people, um, beyond just, you know, so their medical experience um, or their, you know, yeah, so. And I'd agree. I think um, until people have the space to process their loss personally, it's uh, one of the hardest things, you know, as a curator is to get uh, in between uh, kind of yourself and that process, in between the family and that process. So um, a little bit of time and a little bit of respect and a little bit of distance and letting people move through that. But I do think it is important, um, both the isolation and that's easier to document. You know, people who are in nursing homes, people who are completely isolated from family and from kind of touch. Um, some of that we're beginning to document through um, service and care workers who are telling these stories of the effect that that uh, is having on people. Um, but those are the things that are gonna come you know, this won't end when the pandemic ends. We'll be collecting this story for years. So those are the things we'll continue to follow up on and pursue. So we have a kind of richer, more representative record of the effect of all this on people. So I, I think you made just an outstanding point and especially here that this is a story that for all that we are now collecting it, we will be collecting for years, for decades around this story. Um, both of these stories, they are so huge. Um, and it takes so long for communities to process and deal with, and for us as historians to understand this as well. So I wanna thank you all. We're coming to the end of our time. I think that's a really thoughtful note for us to end on. Um, and I hope uh, our audience, I, I know we did not, we were not able to get to everyone's questions. I hope we tried to address many of them. If you do have questions, please send us to the, the questions to our COVID-19. Uh, 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 it's COVID-19 at si.edu uh, inbox. And if you send those questions, we can further them uh, to our colleagues at these wonderful museums. I'm really looking forward when all of this ends, going to Denver, Pittsburgh, and uh, also New York, and really taking a step in to see your museums. So thank you all tremendously. It's been a really interesting and provocative discussion. And we hope you'll join us on December 15th. Thank you again to our speakers. <laughs>